Hello, I'm Kate Chabot. Welcome to SITREP, your weekly look at the big issues in defence and world affairs. Ajax, the Army's next-generation armoured fighting vehicle, is years late and has injured troops with excessive noise and vibration. But a minister says the programme is in recovery and we get up close as troops try it out. Who doesn't want to get in a giant expensive tank and drive it around? A great experience. One of the first gunners on these uh, vehicles. I don't think I could ask for more. Mike will explain why Ajax matters so much and Tim Cooper will update us on how much more there is still to do. NATO is about to get much more flexibility where it parks its tanks and gathers its troops because of the collapse of another arms treaty with Russia. It sets a series of conventional limits on forces, primarily the forces that you would need for a surprise attack on a very large scale. We'll assess how much it will change on the ground. And as Israel sends troops into a hospital in Gaza, the British Army's former top legal advisor in Iraq talks us through the laws of war and how they're applied in the heat of battle. We thought that we'd found Chemical Alley in Basra. The intelligence was wrong. It wasn't even in the building. That's one of the difficulties of real-time legal advice. Zitrep with Kate Chabot and Professor Michael Clark. Well, we've talked a lot about Ajax this year, Mike. Um, It's always involved the word troubled. Ministers seem convinced that's over now, which would be a big relief to a lot of people in the army, wouldn't it? Yes. I mean, I think this has been, I I call it the okey-cokey programme because, you know, we're both in and out. I mean, the programme for Ajax itself began in 2010. But before that, we were in the boxer programme And we pulled out of that in 2003 because we were in with Ajax in 2010. Um, But then when Boxer seemed to work, we went back into Boxer. Then we uh, went out of the um, Ajax programme when we weren't sure we were going to have it. Now we're back in the Ajax programme. So we've been (laughs) in out on both of them um, and we've shaken everything about and Ajax shakes everything about. And here we are now. We think the Ajax programme will deliver full operating capability, we hope, between 2028 and 2029. So thank goodness for that. Yeah, I've got that song in my head now for the whole of this issue. Uh, Training on Ajax was paused for two years because noise and vibration was so bad it injured some troops. But adjustments and health and safety checks are now complete. Training has resumed and SITREP has got up close to see some of the first of the vehicles delivered to the army. Cooper has been looking at the Ajax programme from the production line to the training area on Salisbury Plain. Uh, Tim, hi, good to have you on SITREP. Um, Let's start with Ajax in action. What did you get to see? Hi, Kate. Well, the simple answer to that is an awful lot. It took a while to arrange and lots of meetings to get access and so forth. But quite simply, I got to spend time with the Household Cavalry Regiment uh, in their hangar at Bulford with a whole load of Ajax all in their respective bays. And that was day one and day two out on the training area. And they said, what do you want us to do? And I said, well bit of everything really so we go zooming across the plain see Ajax in open terrain there in and out of water in and out of wood blocks tight turns long sweeping turns 45 miles an hour and yeah okay I was very skeptical I have to say because I've been covering this story for for many years but Mm -hmm. seeing it on the plain in its natural terrain I was impressed The big question, have the problems of noise and vibration been properly fixed? The answer to that from the evidence I've seen is yes. Talking to the people using it, they say yes, it has. Lieutenant James Bird is Troop Commander, Household Cavalry Regiment. Here's what he had to say about that. What has been said should be put in the past. Um, I think that's a completely different vehicle. The one that we've used, we haven't encountered anything like that. We were all very sceptical, not very, but somewhat sceptical as to what we'd experience. But everything that we have done on the vehicle is just proof that it works well. They thought this was going to be problematic. They've had experience of it. And what they found is they like it. And what about its performance as a vehicle, Tim? 
Well, again, from what I can see, uh, it ticks the boxes they need it to tick. And the thing about Ajax is, Ajax is a six-variant family, and uh, it has multiple roles. But the one I saw was the Ajax with the 40 millimeter cannon on it, fully stabilised. And this gives you a sense of the performance, and uh, you can see this in my film. We mounted a, a special camera to the 40 mil gun, pointing back at the turret, and it is so smooth. It enables the Ajax to fire on the move far better than anything that it's been able to do before. I, I, I was staggered by the speed of this thing. The phrase I used at the time to my cameraman Mark when he was filming it was, gosh, this thing turns on a sixpence. It's a bit like a Triumph Herald. It really can whiz around. If it's something that's 40 tonnes, that's pretty amazing. And somebody can answer that question better than me again is Trooper Warren Smith. He's the driver of the Ajax we spent time with, Blues and Royals, and here's what he thinks of driving it. Oh, it's really easy, really simple. You wouldn't think it's 40 tonnes as you're going cross country it's really light really nimble it's proved resilient hasn't it yes yeah, so the reliability has been really good so on exercise four vehicles left camp and people were expecting hours days before first casualty came back through the gates and two weeks later all four vehicles came back in mechanically working just as they left so it's really exceeded expectations of the rest of the regiment i think Trooper Warren Smith there, Blues and Royals driver. He drove the CVRT, had done for many years, and he says they are like chalk and cheese, completely mm. different. Mike, um, for the layman who doesn't know the ins and outs of armoured cavalry operations, where does Ajax fit into that picture? Because it's not actually a tank, but it can fight. Also, there are several versions to do several different jobs, aren't there? Yes, it's to replace the Warrior, which is a, a very good vehicle, which everyone loves and so on. But the Warrior's been around an awful long time. As we've seen, it, it carries a bigger gun. It's got a 40 millimeter gun. And it's the agility of the vehicle, which is quite important. And the fact that it can link into the, the whole I-Star suite means that, in theory, this is the sort of vehicle that can bridge the gap between the armor that you actually need. Have we seen the Ukraine war? You know, tanks really matter, even in, in the Gaza uh, crisis now. Tanks really matter matter armor matters but equally armor can be very vulnerable now to drones and to missiles and so it's got to be pretty nimble and so that the hope is that this is the vehicle that bridges that gap between the heaviness you need for armor but the lightness you need to keep moving around and not to be too vulnerable and the linkage to the ice star warfare the warfare of of uh, electronic communication and uh, instant information access and so this is a, a critical link and, and if Ajax had failed as a vehicle, as a programme, if we ditched it, as some said we should have done a couple of years ago, there would be a really big hole now in the, in the capability of the British land forces because some vehicle has got to take on that role of being uh, lighter than a tank, packs a punch, but links in with the most modern aspects of transformational warfare. OK, Tim, so um, how close or far is Ajax from being able to do its various jobs for real? Well, it's getting there and it's very close. Um, they have things called capability drops and it's basically the phases of development. Now, the big milestone is capability drop three and this is going to happen early next year, early to mid next year. And that means Ajax will be having operationally deployable Ajax vehicles issued to the troops. There'll also be some further enhancements to armor weapon systems, tweaks, you know, from what they've learned during this phase. So that's the big step. And everyone is very excited about that because that means it's gone from a thing that one day will do stuff to a thing that can now do stuff. And Tim, part of the equation, of course, is delivering the vehicles. And you've been to see where they're being built as well. Yeah, I was taken up to the General Dynamics factory in Merthyr Tydville. Yeah, it's it's a special place. It's a, there's a lot of secret stuff there that we weren't allowed to see for very, very good reasons. But they let us look at the production lines. And I spoke to the production manager there. He used to work for a car company, and they've adopted similar techniques. So it is a production line system. They're not putting individual bays and everything bolted up there uh, together. It is a proper production line. And there are production lines for each of the different variants. They're all named after A, so you've got Ajax and you've got Ares, Athena, Apollo, Atlas and Argus. The modularity of the system means that you can have a lot of commonality in parts and then bolt on the various bits. Crucially, and they're really pleased with this, and I sort of get why now, the British Army have personnel there all the time. 
They're working with them through this process. So it isn't General Dynamics building a thing, giving it to the army, and the army going, oh, we don't like this, that, and the other. All of it happens on site there. The, tra- uh, the, the testing and evaluation is a collaborative thing. And if we look at the numbers, the government said in the summer 59 of the vehicles had now been procured. It wants to buy nearly 10 times that number in total. So how rapidly are they being produced? Well, I was told that they're getting near to the point where they're at their top level for production. And that means at any one time there'll be 50 Ajax variants being either built or tested at the site in Merthyr Tidville, and they're getting close to that point. So, you know, it's, it's reaching the point where these things can start to roll out with great frequency, and that obviously fits in with the capability drop three that I mentioned earlier on there. So there was a lot of optimism at the factory, and we spoke to a lot of veterans, actually, military personnel in their previous life who now work on the Ajax programme, and one of them said to me, look, I was involved with vehicles for best part of my 23-year career in the Royal Logistic Corps. Um, Some of them weren't track vehicles, some of them were trucks, but I know that this is a good vehicle because I've seen what Mm. went before. So that was fascinating. And he said to me, this guy, this will save lives and I'm proud to be involved with that. Tim, good to talk to you. Thank you. And you can see Tim's films getting up close with the Ajax on the Forces News website or YouTube channel. Uh, Mike, it's it's not just Ajax. The army is relying on a lot of other new or updated equipment to reshape itself for the future, isn't it? Yeah, uh, I mean, we're talking about three vehicles, really, um, as we mentioned before, Ajax, Boxer and the Challenger 3, the new upgrade of Challenger. And I mean, the Boxer vehicle is also an armoured fighting vehicle, but it's wheeled. So that means it's it's faster in some ways, but less able to take on rough country and others. So Ajax and Boxer together back up the Challenger 3s, which are the updated Challengers, and that's the core of the British Land Army for the future generation. And it's too late to change that now anyway. I think if they work as advertised, then that's a pretty good trio of vehicles. Um, If they don't work as advertised, then we've got a problem. Yeah, on that uh, Challenger 3, uh, Grant Shapps has had his first grilling at the Defence Select Committee, and it's clear at least some of those MPs are worried about feasibility of upgrading Challenger Tank 2s to Challenger 3, putting a new turret on old hulls. Um, it was tried with Warrior and eventually abandoned. Can it be done with Challenger? Yes, it should be able to be. I mean, the Challenger 2 hull is very good and has proved itself and, you know, indeed has been proving itself in Ukraine in these small numbers. And I think there's there's a lot to be drawn from the experience of those challenges when we get to see a bit more about what they've done. So I think it is feasible, but the problem is we're still dealing in very small numbers here. We're still going to have a very small tank force, uniquely small. And if it doesn't work, we've got nowhere else to go. You know, to scrap the whole Challenger program and then say, by the Leopards or by American Abrams M1s would be a disaster, really, which would put put the armoured uh, fighting sort of units back another eight or ten years from where they are now. My goodness, they're already delayed in being up to full operational capability. So, uh, again, as with Boxer and Ajax, it just has to work. OK, let's turn from the question of getting the tanks and armoured vehicles to the question of where we might keep them. In theory, NATO could soon make sweeping changes to where it bases land forces across Europe. It's suspending the Conventional Forces in Europe Treaty signed with Russia more than 30 years ago. It sets limits on how much military might each side could mass in key places. But it's collapsed. Russia's pulled out altogether after years of non-compliance. I've been talking to someone who understands the treaty and therefore what this all means very well. He's William Alberk, a former director of NATO's Armed Control, Disarmament and WMD Non-Proliferation Centre and now a director at the S think tank. It's such a series of conventional limits on forces and primarily it involves the forces that you would need for a surprise attack on a very large scale. So it has five categories of equipment, battle tanks, armored personnel carriers, artillery, combat aircraft, and attack helicopters. And what it does is it establishes a limit for the West and for the East, so for NATO and for the Warsaw Pact. And then it also has sublimits for in the center of Europe, where the massive forces were in West Germany and East Germany facing each other. And then it sets sublimits in what we call the flank areas in the north, Norway and Russia, and in the south, Greece, Turkey, Romania, Bulgaria. So that if, for instance, 
we had a massive amount of force in the center of Europe, you know, across the inter-German border. This wouldn't allow you to take those forces out and then just put them all on the border with Turkey or on the border with Norway and attack there. So there was the central limit to prevent surprise attack in Central Europe and the flank limits to, to prevent massing of forces in the north and the south. And how much impact has it had on European security until now? If the Cold War hadn't ended, it would have provided a degree of stability and assurance that the Soviets could not have mounted a surprise attack. And that would have been very good. But as it turns out, because the Soviet Union collapsed before the treaty was even implemented, what it provided the NATO alliance with a tremendous amount of transparency and also accountability to make sure Russian forces were being withdrawn because we have to remember, it took years for Russia to withdraw all of its conventional forces. I mean, it took until the mid-90s for Russian forces to completely leave the Baltics. And Russian forces still have never left Moldova or Georgia. So this was one of the tools that we used in order to see whether or not Russia was living up to its obligations to honor host nation consent and return to Russia's borders. To the fact now that NATO has suspended itself the treaty, does it mean it can do whatever it wants in terms of land forces in Europe? Well, this was part of the issue is that the NATO alliance really very, very scrupulously followed the limits of the treaty. I mentioned before the flank limits, the, the limits on massing forces in the north and the south. What this meant for NATO was every time we wanted to move anything into Southern Europe, because Greece and Romania and Turkey have a lot of old equipment that was being counted against the limits, they'd have to do all this extra paperwork and all this extra transparency to move anything into Bulgaria or Romania as part of the NATO alliance. And this was just becoming a huge burden where NATO had to negotiate against itself and send all of these notifications just to move a battalion from you know Germany to Romania. Now that those limits are gone, so NATO is able to have more of a free hand in terms of flexibility of where it puts its forces in the centre, in the north and in the south. So in that light, if we look at the example of uh, the en enhanced forward presence in countries like mm. Estonia, where the UK leads a battle group, NATO has always talked about that as a persistent rather than a permanent presence. Might we see uh, those Baltic states become what West Germany was in the Cold War, that the tank park of the West? <laughs> well, I do hope that we put permanent forces in the Baltics, although you have to remember the Baltics are not actually part of the CFE treaty. When the Soviet Union dissolved, the Baltic states were considered occupied territories. The reason we say persistent rotational forces is because of the NATO-Russia Founding Act, because in that document we have a promise not to put substantial combat forces on a permanent basis. On, on allied territory, new bases. And I think that's going away now. Uh, substantial combat forces meaning about of a heavy land brigade. And so I think EFP is going to move to permanent because I do think the social benefits, the societal benefits of permanent stationing, is, especially when you send your families as we did to West Germany, it creates that cultural bond that I think would be very important for the permanent defense of the Baltics. Uh, so I do think we're going to see permanent stationing. I think we're going to see people abjuring the NATO-Russia Founding Act. But it wasn't the CFE treaty that was limiting us there. The CFE treaty is limiting us, however, in Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, uh, the southern flanks of the alliance. And that, I think, is an important change. And to what extent do you think the alliance will build up forces in countries like Romania and Bulgaria? <sighs> I don't think that the NATO allies have been waiting to put massive amounts of divisions permanently in Romania and Bulgaria. I think this will just free up allies to do planning from a tabula rasa to think, OK, what do we need to do based on our own security interests? Now that we're completely unfettered, what would we do? I don't think it's going to look fundamentally different than the decisions that were made at the NATO Vilnius summit. But we'll see. I mean, as we move forward, it'll depend on what Russia does. It'll depend on what happens in Ukraine. Uh, if Ukraine is permanently destabilized, uh, I hope not. Uh, but, you know, that'll force us to think about a different force posture in Southern Europe. Whereas if, you know, Ukraine joins the NATO alliance, that'll mean a fundamentally different force posture down there. So we have yet to see what we will need to do to defend Europe in the future. And a lot of it will depend on how the war in Ukraine ends. Given that Russia suspended participation in the treaty in 2007, does this right. have any impact in terms of what it will do with its forces? 
No, I mean, if you look at the compliance reports from the U.S. State Department, Russia has never fully complied with the CFE Treaty. So its flank limits, which it started to exceed right away in order to wage its two wars in Chechnya, uh, it never came under the limits. We actually modified the limits of the treaty in 1996 to try to accommodate what Russia was doing, and then again in 1999. And ultimately, we were never able to satisfy Russia, and Russia never came into compliance with the original CFE treaty. So I don't think this is really going to change anything for them. It was really getting out of the notifications in 2007 that gave Russia a much freer hand in terms of its invasion of Georgia, its 2014 invasion of Ukraine, and the 2022 invasion of Ukraine. So really, this has been a limit that we've been keeping on ourselves for no good reason. And how concerned are you now that this treaty may be consigned to history and how that may affect geopolitics? I mean, I'm sad. I mean, I've been working on conventional arms control for years, but I also have to recognize it has not fulfilled its purposes since at least 2007, and we never really took Russian non-compliance seriously enough. And, you know, by the treaty, Russia should not be occupying Moldova or Georgia. So uh, I don't think we should hold on to treaties for treaty's sake. If they no longer fulfill their core mission, we have to let them go. Otherwise, you run into this terrible position where you say we have a treaty, but it doesn't do anything. That undermines arms control itself. Fascinating talking to you, William L. Burke. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Uh, Mike, William mentioned there the transparency it's brought. Sharing information about military movements was key to that treaty. You often talk about the risk of miscalculation from misunderstanding when opponents aren't talking. How much is that risk about to change? Yes. um, I mean, that changes for all sorts of reasons. And it's very important that uh, potential opponents talk to each other or keep the lines of communication open. And I think, as William was saying there, the uh, although the the, the CFE treaty has been effectively dead since 2007, when the uh, Russians basically said they weren't going to observe it anymore, it's a shame when a piece of arms control goes down. And now there's no there's no effective arms control anywhere now between you know, what used to be the East and West or between Russia and America, Russia and the West Europeans. Um, strategic arms limitation talks are have, have just about rolled over, but nothing else has. So, you know, the anti-ballistic missile treaty is gone. Um, the uh, Testman treaties have virtually gone. The CFE mm-hmm. treaty is now gone. And, and th- this whole edifice of arms control, which builds predictability, it institutionalizes the relationship, has just one by one, those, those treaties have just failed faded away or been abrogated. And this is a, a symbolic moment that the CFE is now, uh, as it were, that we've, it's been dead for a while and now we've finally interred the corpse. NATO will certainly welcome uh, the reduction in paperwork, but in terms of size and laydown of forces, do, do you think it will make much difference? Not now, I don't think, um, uh, because we'd, we'd arrived at the point where we were building up forces uh, for different reasons. I mean, it, for the future, if NATO wants to move forces around quickly in response to a crisis, military crisis with Russia, then it will be more able to do so. And in that respect, it's, it's better that the treaty isn't there in that respect. But against that is the fact that when the Russians move their forces around, um, we've got no treaty reason to question what they do or to demand uh, transparency. So all in all, um, both sides are more flexibly um, sort of structured now because of the the collapse of of the final collapse of the CFE treaty. Um, I I wish we weren't so flexibly structured because I prefer the predictability. But that's where we are at the moment. News, discussions and analysis. This is SITREP. The Israel-Gaza war is already the deadliest and most destructive conflict there since Hamas took power in 2007. Israel has had much political support from allies for its military mission to destroy Hamas after the group's terrorist atrocity on October the 7th. But those same allies, including the UK and US, have shifted tone, putting more stress on their calls for civilians to be protected and the laws of war to be observed. Israel, like all UN member states, is signed up to international humanitarian law, to give its formal title, as laid out in the Geneva Conventions. The key principles are clear, including minimising civilian casualties, proportionality and military necessity of any action. 
But the detail is often interpreted very differently depending on who you ask. To understand how it works and how interpretations might differ, say, between the UK and Israel, I've been talking to someone who's had to make those legal judgments in combat operations. In 2003, Reverend Nicholas Mercer was known as Lieutenant Colonel Mercer, and he was the Army's top legal advisor on the ground in the Iraq War. My job as the commander legal in the 1st Armoured Division was to give real-time legal advice to the GOC of the 1st Armoured Division on the laws of war during the battle. So to just give you an example, for instance, on the close battle for Basra, we were worried about firing artillery into Basra itself and whether it complied with the law of armed conflict. So Commander Royal Artillery sought me out. We went through the type of artillery that might be used and found a schematic that would ensure that any artillery strike was in accordance with the laws and customs of war. The first Geneva Protocol of 1977 is really the definitive document because that set out for the first time the laws that apply to targeting. And it's very relevant to the situation in Israel and Gaza at the moment. If you listen to Mark Regev, the advisor to Benjamin Netanyahu on the radio and the television, he's quoting from the first Geneva Protocol all the time, because that really is the definitive document for this conflict. But how yeah. do you determine that every effort has been made or that steps have been taken to reduce civilian casualties as much as possible? Someone can always argue that more could have been done. Yeah, possibly. Um, I think you, if you knew what went on with targeting, I think people will be surprised just how much care is taken. I can only speak for the British, but normally there's a target set in advance of a conflict. And all those targets are, are models in advance model with the direction of attack, the type of munition used, and the collateral damage anticipated. And that has to be signed off by both a lawyer and a political advisor. So it's quite a sophisticated operation. So if someone did say that was in breach of the laws of war, you would show your workings out uh, if ever that came to a court. And can you actually measure proportionality? I mean, particularly when civilian lives are being lost, can it be objectively measured, do you think? That's a very good question. What is acceptable? I think that the ratio varies depending on the military advantage anticipated. So by way of example, in the Iraq war, we thought that we'd found Chemical Alley in Basra, and he was hiding in a building there. Therefore, if if you're going to strike a regime figure, the military advantage anticipated is very high. Therefore, the tolerance, that's a really horrid word, but the tolerance for damage and casualties is higher because the military advantage it anticipated is greater. And it's in the circumstances existing at the time. As it happened, it wasn't even in the building. The intelligence was wrong. That's one of the difficulties of real-time legal advice and you know, targeting in the midst of a battle. That's, you know, unfortunately, that it's very difficult to know whether the information you've been given is accurate at all times. And when you look at what has happened in Gaza, uh, where hospitals have been left without power, the World Health Organization says at least 22 hospitals have been damaged. Israel says it's launched a targeted operation inside the largest hospital because it says Hamas is operating from tunnels beneath it. Um, Based on what we know from limited media reporting, would that meet UK tests for military necessity, do you think? That's really difficult. The first thing to say is that if if there are protected objects in a battle, so for instance, religious buildings and medical buildings are protected. However, if that protection is violated, in other words, it's used by the enemy for military operations, then it loses its protected status. But that doesn't negate the need to protect civilians when it comes to military operations against them. So in the case of a hospital, the the requirement in law to protect the very, very vulnerable civilians in a hospital will weigh very heavily on the decision making. And in those circumstances, you're more likely to put in a surgical strike, so to speak, so the troops around it and then you send in, as the Israelis have done in Al-Sharif Hospital, They've sent in commando teams, so the civilians are kept safe, and then the tunnels are then cleared. 
and then report it. So in my view, that's the way to do it. Contrast that, however, with the Jabalia refugee camp, where the Israelis put a JDAM bomb into the middle of the refugee camp. And you've got to ask yourself whether that is in accordance with the laws of war, particularly proportionality and distinction. There is a further complicating factor in this war, determining who is a combatant and who is a civilian. Um, that's clear when both sides are state militaries, but we've also faced this with counterinsurgency in Iraq and Afghanistan. How do you do that? Well, yes, well, distinction still applies, but it, it makes it much harder. That's why they don't wear uniform. It makes it very hard for the troops. Uh, you can, to a degree, assist the troops. So we, when we were advising on British troops in Basra, for instance, if they were carrying a weapon, then that was an obvious engagement that you could undertake. Um, and you've seen some of the um, drone footage or the satellite imagery of members of Hamas with rocket propelled grenades, for instance. And so obviously carrying a weapon, they can be engaged. It's as simple as that. So you don't know if they're, we presume they're Hamas. But in, in, in Basra, for instance, it was difficult to see as a sort of almost a custom of ca carrying weapons. Even if you weren't fighting against the enemy, it was very dangerous. And, you, and what, are you, what are you there to tell troops? You can help the troops, but ultimately the decision comes down to them. Reverend, formerly Lieutenant Colonel Nicholas Mercer there. Uh, Mike, when we were talking and he mentioned legal and political advisers signing off on targeting, reminded me of our conversation earlier this year with Sir Michael Fallon, who told us that in the early days of the counter IS campaign, he was having to sign off individual strikes, including the type of munitions being used. A real surprise, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Um, I mean, I didn't think it went up quite that high, but it also, that's indicative of how sensitive this is. Remember, this was the um, anti-ISIS um, uh, uh, campaign against Islamic State. Whereas Nicholas Mercer was saying there, you're dealing with irregulars, you're dealing with people who don't wear uniform. And th in a way, the audience for these strikes is uh, your own public opinion and world public opinion. And so all Western countries, and, and interestingly, as, as um, Nicholas Mercer said, Mark Regev, the Israeli um, uh, spokesman for, in the Prime Minister's office, is very, very keen to keep saying that they they observe the same conventions that the target set has to be very, very carefully chosen and all those legal and moral considerations taken care of. Um, Western militaries do try to do this because, not, not only because it's the right thing to do, but because they have to play to public opinion and they have to justify their choices. It's something that the Russians don't have to worry too much about. And I'd be very, very surprised if the Russians put that sort of effort, anything like that sort of effort, into choosing their target sets. Um, I think they just th think about military necessity every time, virtually regardless of the cost. And Mike, I said at the start that the tone from Israel's allies has changed. Is Israel at risk of losing some key backing? Yes, yeah. You know, if it were done, when it is done, then it were well, it were done quickly, as mm. uh, Shakespeare's Macbeth says. If you're going to do a dreadful thing, do it quickly. And the Israelis know that they will be running out of time. What they're doing in Gaza is necessary from their point of view, from the point of view of their security, but it's dreadful. And it will get more dreadful the longer it goes. And they know, and they anticipated this, and we talked about this, I think, on the program, that you know they, they, have a wi they had a window of real sympathy after the 7th of October, which would start to close quite quickly once they began real operations in Gaza, because it's a small place, very tiny little strip, 28 miles long, five miles wide, with 2.3 million people in it. And they are now trying to eliminate a, a, a terrorist group inside that tiny battle space and so what they're trying to do is very difficult it is dreadful for the civilian community and if they're going to succeed then they've got to succeed quickly before the world really turns against them uh, Mike, thank you. Um, the legal questions can be incredibly complex, but Nicholas Mercer gives a clear insight into the decision-making process. We also discussed how the Balkan wars have shaped the laws and how any justice processes for both sides in the Middle East might happen. You can hear much more in an extra edition of the SITREB podcast online now. Mike, uh, thank you and thanks to all of our guests. Professor Michael Clark and I will be back with another SITREB next Thursday. For now, though, from me, Kate Chabot, Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.